Ahoy crew, welcome aboard for this rather unconventional episode, what we can loosely call a mini-episode, I think. I hope to start sprinkling these throughout the main body of episodes more often as we move forward, just as a way to discuss updates to uh, past topics on previous episodes, or as will be the case today, to shed a little more light on something that we barely touched on previously, but that has recently surfaced in the news coverage um, that a lot of you see on Twitter and Facebook. It really has made the rounds in the last week or so. A surprisingly large number of you listeners were kind enough to share the story with me, so I got some details from a few different sources. Thanks to all of you who saw the news and who thought of the podcast here and took the time to pass it along. So, the news in question relates to the Egyptian port city of Thonis Heraklion. We touched on this city ever so briefly in our discussion about Naukratis and the maritime trade connections between the early Greek world and Egypt proper. Naukratis was further up the Nile River, which is actually further south into Egypt, but to get there, ships from the Mediterranean would have had to pass through this city of Thonis Heraklion. We'll get into it today, but in episode 29, I think I made a joke about Thonis Heraklion functioning kind of like the toll keeper, the toll taker, the gatekeeper of the Nile, something like that. And it reminded me of the Keeper of the Bridge of Death in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. What is your name? And all that. Now, while the Gatekeeper analogy wasn't wholly off-base, it was maybe a bit misleading. You see, Greek or other foreign ships from the Mediterranean didn't pass through Thonis and route to Naukratis or further south, at least not that often from what we can tell. It seems that in the Egyptian port city, in the Nile Delta, ships that were built for transit on the Mediterranean Sea were offloaded once they docked in Thonis, and then the goods that they had brought to Egypt from further north were shuffled onto purpose-built Egyptian ships that could then carry on in the different riverine conditions of the Nile as it cuts a swath through Egypt. I, this makes sense to me, honestly, but it's not something that was really on my radar in the past. That's part of the glory of podcasting, though. It's not like I'm writing a book that is forever set in stone. I can update as we go along, and I can draw attention to things I might have said in the past that weren't totally on base. Now, another side issue is the rather strange way that some publishers are now starting to update ebooks, much in the way that software is updated with, you know, a 1.1, 1.2 version, and so on. I think that's a little strange, and I've seen that a few times recently. But the point I'm getting at is that podcasts are great, and I think we can all agree there. So now to the news item. It relates to Thonis Heraklion, which was first discovered in the year 2000 by a pioneering underwater archaeologist named Frank Godio. It's located near the canopic mouth of the Nile, not too far from Alexandria and very near the Mediterranean, which makes it the perfect entry port into Egypt for ships coming from the north, from Greece in particular. Thonis Heraklion has made significant waves in the archaeology and history worlds since its discovery, because it's one of those cities where scholars were perplexed for a number of centuries about its location, even its existence. The names Thonis and Heraklion occur in the histories of Diodorus, Strabo, and Herodotus, but until the discovery of this single site near Abu Kerb Bay, scholars generally thought that Thonis and Heraklion were actually two separate cities, and that they were further inland from the Mediterranean and from the Nile Delta. 
There are even mentions of this city or cities in Egyptian decrees and stele, but even these mentions from Egypt herself didn't really help solve the mystery. As we've said, in 2000, archaeologists made the first finds, and they confirmed that an Egyptian city had been submerged in the sea and lost to history. The city itself can be traced back to around the 8th century BCE, so about the time when Homer was putting the Iliad and maybe the Odyssey to written memory. Thonis Heraclean really flourished in the 6th to the 4th centuries BCE, the late period of ancient Egypt, ushered in by Psamtik I and ushered out courtesy of Alexander the Great. It is smack in the middle of the Egyptian late period that further to the north, the Greeks were busy fending off the Persians, which is what we're talking about in the main podcast feed now. And um, about 50 years after the Battle of Salamis, still in the Egyptian late period though, Herodotus of Halicarnassus wrote his groundbreaking histories. Herodotus is the famous father of history, and he tried to see firsthand the things that he put down for posterity. But there has always been that controversy among scholars about whether Herodotus is reliable or whether he was given to hyperbole and sometimes pure fantasy, it's claimed. His reputation has ebbed and flowed in academic circles, to be sure, but the recent news connected to Thonis Heraclion is directly tied to Herodotus, and here's why. Thonis Heraclion was a port city, intersected by canals, dotted with harbors and caves for boats and ships of all kinds to dock and transact business. After all, the Greek world flourished mightily, both before the Persian Wars, but even more so after and a healthy portion of their business found its way to Egyptian ports, Thonis Heraclion being one of the main ports in northern Egypt. To get back on track, this city is tied to Herodotus because he seems to have visited during his journeys around the ancient world to document the world as he saw it. In classic Herodotian style, he gets on a rabbit trail. In book two of his histories, he winds up talking about events from the Iliad, and he drops in the remark that the canopic mouth of the Nile was guarded by Thonis, who barred Paris and Helen of Troy from entering Egypt prior to the events of the Trojan War. Herodotus, in a different passage but in the same book of the histories, he discusses his investigation into the cult of Heracles and that Greek hero's ancient roots, ancient even to Herodotus. He mentions that in the same area of Egypt where Thonis guarded the Nile, and this is the canopic mouth of the Nile, in the same region supposedly stood a temple to Heracles. So, even in the words of Herodotus, we can see a reference to both the Egyptian name and the Greek name of the city that we now know as Thonis Heraclion. The city is just immensely fascinating, I have to say. There's a temporary exhibition at the Art Institute in my hometown now, where there's artifacts from the site, and most all of them from the actual site of Thonis Heraclion, were discovered thanks to the work of underwater archaeologists, so it's of particular interest to me and to the podcast here. The exhibition is just amazing. Look it up online if you're interested. Um, there's some pretty good images that give a good overall feel of what all is there. I might have a fun collaboration on um, this ancient Egyptian city and on the exhibition in the works, by the way, it remains to be seen entirely, but stay tuned for news on that possibility. Now, to get to my actual main point today. It's also in book two of the Histories of Herodotus 
that we find a description about a type of boat that the writer saw firsthand in Egypt, a boat that has had maritime historians and nautical historians a bit confused for quite a long time. The glorious thing about the discovery of Thonis Heraklion as a site is that it was an entrepot. It was a port city that saw heavy traffic for a number of centuries. Therefore, it's a prime resting place for ships, for shipwrecks, along with the cargo that they carried, and other related clues to help us better understand the many nuances and intricacies of maritime trade in and around the Mediterranean and Egypt in the 6th through the 4th centuries BCE, even into the periods after that a little bit, the Ptolemaic period especially. Now, to get into the main focus for this mini-episode today, I'm going to read a passage, the passage from Herodotus, where he describes the type of boat that he witnessed in Egypt, the one that has confused historians for a bit. He describes it and calls it a baris boat, and this is a specific term that we see in the Egyptian records, but um, there hadn't really been any examples of this type of boat found to date, but that's what we're here to talk about today. So, to read this section, it's 2.96 from the histories of Herodotus. Here we go. He writes, quote, The boats they use to carry freight are made of acacia wood, which exudes drops of gum. The tree is most similar in form to the Cyrenian lotus. They cut planks of wood three and a half feet long from this tree and set them together like bricks. They build their ships by inserting long, closely set dowels to fasten the wooden planks together, and when they have thus constructed a boat, they place cross planks over it. They do not put any ribs in at all, but actually caulk the joints inside with papyrus. Only one steering oar is made, which is inserted through the keel. The masts are made of acacia wood, their sails of papyrus. With these boats, they cannot sail upstream in the river unless a strong wind prevails. Otherwise, they must be towed along from the shore. But here is how they sail downstream. They construct a door-shaped raft of tamarisk, stitch it together with matted reeds, and tie it by a rope to the front of the boat, so that the boatman can let it float on ahead. In addition, they take a stone that weighs about two talents, 110 pounds or so, and has a hole bored through it and tie that to the back of the boat. The raft moves swiftly forward with the rushing current, and thus pulls the baris, for this is what the Egyptians call these boats, while the stone is dragged behind and being deep under the water, helps to keep the boat steady. They have a large number of these boats, some of which can carry many thousands of talents in weight. So that is the description from Herodotus. And before we dive into a discussion about the specific ship that was discovered at Thonis Heraklion, let's just cover a few things from that passage that have been debated. The reference to a brickwork planking style is actually not one of those topics that is debated. This style of hull planking is pretty well evidenced in boat and ship depictions from various periods throughout Egyptian history. The following reference, though, to the long, closely set dowels to fasten the wooden planks together, this is one of the descriptions that has confused scholars for quite a while. Most of the Egyptian ship and boat remains that have been discovered to date don't share this characteristic. Take the Khufu solar barge, for example, which had small mortise and tenon joints and then had internal lashings that allowed the ship to be disassembled and transported in pieces. Now, I don't want to get super deep into the weeds, uh, partially for time concerns, partially just because it would get me out of my depth altogether. 
So I'll finally point out that Herodotus mentions that these Barris boats also lacked internal ribs. Um, that's a point of contention as well, but we can move forward for now. The excavation work that has been making the rounds in news coverage lately is specific to one ship out of at least 60 ancient Egyptian boat and ship remains that have been located in what would have been the harbors and canals of Thonis Heraklion. Ship 17 is the specific one that has had the most data published so far. It was the first ship to really be excavated and studied intently. It might actually be the only one so far, but I'm not totally sure where the ongoing work is focused right now, and if they've really studied a lot of the other ships yet. Now, the headlines that you probably saw online somewhere, they made reference to the excavation of Ship 17 as, quote, proving Herodotus right in his descriptions of the ancient Egyptian Barris. Technically, I guess that's an okay way to view it. I feel like it's a kind of narrow way to view all of the work that's being done at Thonis Heraklion. There's a whole lot more to the story than that. On a side note, and maybe it's pedantic, but Herodotus was right all along, and it's just now by dint of the hard work that's being done by many archaeologists in Egypt that we're finally able to see the primary archaeology, the physical remains, and these are providing us with a whole lot more data than the father of history could have ever hoped to, and we're not proving him right, we're just seeing that he was right all along, and we're finally catching up. Anyways, that is not to discount the importance of studying the historical text, rather just to say that the texts and the archaeology that's being done are two different lenses through which to view the distant past, and that in this case the archaeology is providing us with a dramatically wider picture. The reality is, though, that up until 20 years ago, all we had was Herodotus, at least on the subject of the Barris ship. So then, what exactly have we learned through a study of Ship 17? The long and the short of it is that Herodotus describes the Barris as a cargo vessel, and that's exactly what this Ship 17 appears to be. I should note here, too, by the way, that all the fantastic work done on this ship has been published by a Russian archaeologist named Alexander Belov, and I'm going to link to at least a few of his papers. Um, they're all accessible online. Tons of data, detail, images, so do check those out if you'd like to learn more about this ship. You can get way more in-depth than any of the um, news coverage has been able to do so far. But it is, you know, it was over my head in places too. Interesting, though. So check out the show notes if you're looking for links to those papers. Um, I'll try to include a few images as well to help give you an idea of the ship that we're talking about. Now, Belov has confirmed through studying and even through 3D modeling this ship that it was a surprisingly large cargo ship, and it seems to have been built using the same method that the smaller Egyptian Barris ships were. Herodotus seems to have been describing a smaller vessel based on the dimensions that he shares. For instance, the reference to the hull planks being two cubits long. That translates to about 104 centimeters in length, or about three and a half feet. But the planks on ship 17 are nearly twice this length on average. However, Herodotus does allow in his description that Barris ships were being built at different sizes, and, well, a longer ship would require longer planks. The planking pattern, as we mentioned a moment ago, aligns precisely with the one that Herodotus described, and it's actually a pretty common um, planking style, a uh, structural design, that we see in a lot of ancient Egyptian vessels. 
The characteristic on Ship 17 that was among the most surprising, and the one that perhaps most confirms the accuracy of Herodotus's description, if we want to view things from that angle, this characteristic relates to the tenons or the dowels that was in the quote that we read a moment ago that were used to join the hull planks together. We discussed in our look at the Khufu solar barge way back in early episodes that Egyptian boats and ships tended to use cords to lash the hull planks together internally, and they used small mortise and tenon joints between the edges of the hull planks or the strakes. They used these at alternating points to help give the hull its needed strength, and then the small tenons and lashings were used to function like laces that would pull the hull planks tight and hold the ship itself together. On Ship 17, though, this construction method is entirely absent. Instead, the planks are quite a bit wider than we see in older or in ceremonial Egyptian ships. And instead of seeing small tenons that join only two plank edges to one another, we see very long tenons or dowels that run through the center of many planks or strakes. There's one section of the boat that the tenon runs through 11 strakes, one tenon does. Now, it's a little hard to describe the design and the construction of these ships just orally, and I appreciate that. I'm a visual learner when it comes to this type of stuff, and I apologize if the descriptions that I'm struggling to put together leave you scratching your head. Do check out the papers that I will link to. There's some very helpful illustrations there to give a better idea of what we're talking about. The best analogy um, that's not related to boats or ships that I could come up with to describe this idea is, you know, kind of just made up, and it's kind of sad, I feel like, but hopefully it helps illustrate the point enough so that you have a sense of what we're describing. So in my mind, the slats of a wooden fence jumped out a little bit, and I know the f that a fence isn't the same everywhere around the world. There are hundreds, thousands of styles of fence, but in the suburbias of the United States, um, if you're from one like I am or if you've been through one, hopefully just your standard six-foot wooden fence is easy to visualize. I'm talking bare bones, basic, nothing fancy. The main strength of these fences um, come from the posts that are cemented into post holes, but the main length of the fence is made up with the thin fence slats that are just aligned one next to each other, similar to the strakes of a hull, in that way at least, that they are thinner pieces of wood, they're arranged side by side along their long edges. Now obviously a fence and a ship hull are very different, but I'm thinking about the way that these fence slats are connected together as they hang between the posts of the fence. Typically, you'll see a long rail piece that runs near the top and near the bottom of the fence, normally on the inner edge facing into the backyard or whatever the fence is surrounding, so that on the outside you just see the slats and nothing else, much like when you're looking at the outside of a ship's hull. You don't see all the stuff on the inside that is holding those planks or the strakes together. Now, the fence slats in our example, they're typically nailed or they're stapled into the rail, and this is what keeps the fence slats level, it keeps them connected together, and it gives them some flexibility if the fence needs to bend, if it's windy or something like that. Now, a fence rail is typically just a 2x4 piece of lumber, but it's pretty long. On average, it runs the entire length between each post and it is what gives strength and stability to the slats of the fence. It, what, it's what holds everything together. In my mind, the long dowels or tenons that Herodotus described, and the ones that were found to be part of the structure of Ship 17, they function in the same way, roughly. The only difference on Ship 17 
is that these dowels or tenons, they weren't just nailed to the inside of the ship's hull strakes. They were actually inserted into channels that were cut into the inner center of each strake edge. So each strake or plank, it had a rectangular channel cut out of the inside, and then the strakes were built up by lining their channel holes over where the tenons were, then sliding each plank down along the tenon to, I guess if they started at the bottom, which seems to be the case from archaeological work that's been done, each plank was slid along the center dowels down to where the keel, the flat bottom, was, and then you'd just slide the next one on, and this way would build the planks up, which would form the ship's hull. Hopefully that all makes sense. I'm sorry if it didn't make any sense at all, um, but like I said, check out some images and hopefully they will help clear things up. Nevertheless, the presence of these abnormally long internal dowels that connected the strakes together is remarkable in Ship 17, and it's one of the ways that this Barris ship lines up with the description from Herodotus. Now, it's interesting as well because Herodotus mentions that the Barris he saw lacked any internal ribs. And normally on a ship's hull, you think of an internal rib framework which provides structural solidity for the actual hull itself. On a Barris of smaller dimensions than Ship 17, it's entirely conceivable that these long tenons would have been enough support and that internal framework or ribs wouldn't have been necessary. But on Ship 17, there are what Belov calls half-frames or bracing timbers. Now, they're not full-fledged internal ribs per se. They, they don't run the entire length of the inside of the hull, but they are a departure from the complete absence that Herodotus described. The theory that makes the most sense, um, it's been propounded by Belov, and I totally agree with him. This, this theory says that Ship 17 was built with the exact same methods that a Barris ship or a smaller boat would have been built, built with the same method that Herodotus described, but that because it is so large, it just necessitated the use of extra internal supports and that these may have been added piecemeal as the situation required later in the ship's life just to add extra strength to the hull in various places. This could have happened over a course of years, and the ship may not have been designed that way originally. So there are a few remaining characteristics described by Herodotus that seem to be present in Ship 17. One of these is the use of papyrus between the plank seams to help serve as a caulking material almost. This description in Herodotus was also debated for quite a long time. Some scholars viewed the description um, as meaning that the planks were lashed together, like the older Egyptian boat remains um, we've talked about were. But Ship 17 seems to have had papyrus inserted between the planks as they were being assembled, so that when the ship was then launched into the water, the vegetal material, um, papyrus, or whatever else they used, it would have been between the planks, it would have expanded as it got wet, and it would have helped serve to stop up any gaps in the joints between each strake. Finally, Ship 17 um, clearly contained a single rudder that was run through a hole in the ship's keel. Um, it's what we call an axial rudder. This find on Ship 17 is actually pretty significant because prior to finding it on the remains of an actual ship, this rudder style was only seen in boat models from ancient Egypt, in iconographic depictions from the walls of tombs and stuff like that, and also in the description shared by Herodotus. So this characteristic of Ship 17 is the first physical ship that we found in ancient Egypt that confirms all of those depictions. 
Now, there is a fair bit more that could be said about Ship 17. We didn't get into at all the propulsion methods that Herodotus described or, you know, a few of the other things. But I think that we really have covered the high points. The rest is in the research that's been published. For today, I think I will sum everything up and then we can call it a wrap. Ship 17, like most Barris ships we can surmise, was a cargo vessel. It was built of rough-hewn planks of acacia wood. It wasn't built for show, with thin sculpted planks like those of a ceremonial vessel. Ship 17 was built of wide, flat, pretty standardized planks that contained many knots and imperfections, but these would have retained their strength and resulted in a workhorse of a ship. That work would have been carried out on almost exclusively on the Nile or within the river's delta region. So this Barris ship's profile of being flat-keeled and flat-bottomed, it would have been quite well suited for navigation in the river conditions that the Nile presented. Local wood was used to build this ship, and the overall construction style differed quite markedly from the ships that we know the Egyptians used as seagoing vessels, mainly those that they used from their Red Sea ports. Ship 17 measured out at 27 meters long, or about 88 feet. It had a beam of 8 meters, or about 27 feet, so it was quite large for a river vessel, but this, of course, was perfect for hauling cargo. After modeling the ship and running calculations, the team that discovered her estimates that her deadweight tonnage would have been about 112 metric tons, which is just remarkable for a wooden vessel like this, but it would have made her very useful to the ancient Egyptians who built her. All in all, Ship 17 appears to both confirm that Herodotus was accurate in his descriptions of the Barris vessels that were used in late period Egypt, but it also gives us a fascinating glimpse into the local river use vessels that Egypt must have used constantly in the Delta regions. Thonis Heraklion was a bustling international port, and Ship 17 certainly played a part in that commerce before she was eventually scuttled and lay on the bottom of the canal there for over 2,000 years until she was rediscovered less than 20 years ago and brought back into the light of our analysis. So I hope this look at Ship 17 and at Thonis Heraklion more broadly has been worthwhile. I plan to do these off-track, shorter episodes more often as new discoveries or publications come to light and allow us to talk about things um, that are more contemporary. For now, though, I'm off to put the finishing touches on our episode about the Battle of Salamis, and that episode will be coming your way in the near future. I will sign off with that. Fair winds and following seas, crew. And until next time, thanks for listening to the Maritime History Podcast. Podcast.